So are we up and rolling yet? Looks like we are. Yep. So today we're going to be talking about um, cardiovascular damage or heart disease, heart damage. Someone asked me a, um, a couple of times back, they had heard that there was direct damage to the heart. There's a good article in JAMA just uh, last week that gets into the de details of that, and we're going to cover that today. Uh, before we cover that, though, I just want to mention a few other topics that we've covered recently or will be covering. First of all, the topic for tomorrow is mouse traps, mouse traps, distancing, and transmission rates. As usual, it's maybe there's a great video out there. You can take a look at it. I'll show it to you in just a minute. But it may not be that simple. It may get into more discussion of, is this an accurate reflection of the impact on the reproductive index? Uh, clearly, it's a practical way to communicate the uh, need for social distancing and some other practical discussions. So let me go back and actually show that video for those of you who haven't seen it. It only takes 30 seconds. Nifty video, huh? Really makes a good point about, um, let me see if I can close that out. Okay, it really makes a good point about social distancing and the importance of social distancing. We're actually going to talk a little bit more about that video in terms of, like I said, uh, yes, very clear, very quick, 30-second, powerful point. But what does it say about the r not? What uh, the reproductive index? What does it say about communications? Uh, are there some other things that we uh, need to be thinking about in terms of that? Janice will be joining me for that. So as you'll see, it won't be uh, maybe overly geeky. Some other items that we've covered recently, silver linings. We talked about a lot of the ways the world's going to change in a positive way associated with uh, the pandemic. Um, big increase in use of telemedicine. Um, we've covered uh, things like um, ACE receptor uh, uh, updates. Hopefully we'll get back around to that again. The bottom line on it is don't change your blood pressure medications. Um, <clears throat> New Zealand, maybe are they really squashing the curve? And again, showing the impact yet again of social distancing on uh, dealing with the pandemic curve. So again, quick topics about telemedicine. Can it help us flatten that curve? Can it help the baby boom, boomer generation that's um, in most need of chronic disease care, medical care, and the same generation that is least likely to wrap its head around getting medicine through remote means? Big issues in this space. Google's uh, introduced some COVID-19 telehealth links for healthcare providers. Harvard is saying, yes, we think it can help flatten the curve. Here's what I'm saying. I'm, I'm working with a group called K-Health in New York. They're located in New York, the epicenter right now of this problem. And K-Health is going great guns. K-Health is um, adding uh, artificial intelligence to the mix and significant improvement in healthcare uh, from my perspective. Uh, I've got another meeting with them today. We're uh, um, credentialing like 20 to 30 people per week, whereas we used to do that in a month. So big, big changes in the telemedicine space. Doug came on and talked about he's finally starting his teledentistry program. We had a lot of his WDN dentists join us and um, make some very positive comments. I can tell you, from uh, personal experience, my wife, for example, um, is now finding that uh, 
her endocrinologist is interested in and excited about doing telemedicine. So telemedicine is beginning to make some big changes. As I said, uh, hopefully we'll get a little bit deeper in terms of discussion on uh, ACE uh, receptors, ACE2 receptors. As you know, that's the, the receptor that the, um, the coronavirus uh, protein uses to get into the cell. So a lot of people thought early on, oh my goodness, people that are on ACE, uh, ACE receptor blockers or angiotensin receptor blockers, um, ACE inhibitors maybe shouldn't be taking those medications. Actually, as you major focus uh, on that area, as you get deeper and deeper into it, uh, if anything, the pendulum has swung the other way. But again, don't recommend a lot of changes. So let's get to uh, this discussion for today. And it has to do with cardiovascular, uh, cardi cardiac disease. Um, what we call myocardial disease. In other words, damage to the heart tissue itself. There was a great article, uh, again, by a lot of, uh, some, a lot of the, some of the original Chinese docs that were watching this happen as it started off in China. It's in uh, JAMA Cardiology, and it's the cardiovascular implications of fatal outcomes of patients with coronavirus disease. So in other words, basically, uh, the simple story is this. There's no question that there's damage happening to the heart tissue itself. Somebody asked me that again a couple of times after hearing some signals about that, I think, in the, uh, in the news. And my response at that point um, is still what you're going to end up with at the end of this article, and that is... Yes, there's no question there's damage to the heart. Here's the question. Is that damage due to inflammation? In other words, just the general problem of going into acute respiratory distress syndrome, or is the damage from the virus actually infecting the heart tissue? There's no question that both of these things are happening. The question is how much of which one is causing the damage? Um, and why is that a question? Well, different causations of problems imply different treatments. If the, if the bigger part of the damage is the virus in attacking the muscle wall, I mean the muscle itself, then, you, then the implication is that antivirals can be more helpful. On the other hand, if it's inflammation, and too much fluid, too much, uh, again, inflammation from the, uh, in the lungs causing decreased oxygenation of the heart tissue. In other words, uh, damaging the heart tissue because it's still pumping even though it's not getting enough oxygen. In that case, that implies treatment more with um, anti-inflammatories. So that's the bottom line. Let's get a little bit more into detail. Again, the article's in JAMA Cardiology, March 27th. Um, looked at 187 patients in Wuhan, China. Uh, about 30% had myocardial injury. Now, what does that mean? Um, myo meaning heart, I mean uh, muscle, and cardial meaning heart. So heart muscle injury. Some had an underlying uh, heart condition, some didn't. Uh, they were much more likely to have, people with significant damage are much more likely to have had previous um, heart problems. The sort of problems that they had were cardiovascular disease. In other words, they had plaque in the arteries of their hearts. You guys that watch this channel on a regular basis know exactly what that means. That means a positive calcium score. Um, it means a positive stress test. Now, the problem with the stress test, though, is that you can get plaque and um, uh, two thirds of people that have a heart attack are gonna be um, negative on a stress test because a stress test only starts showing plaque if you've got 50% or more occlusion of flow. Most plaque doesn't occlude flow that much. But um, again, what is that back to the, the connection here? any type of plaque, any level of plaque, and the more plaque 
it uh, it would appear the worse the uh, the risk for for this issue because again you're talking about the ability to oxygenate blood cells and uh, I mean uh, heart cells and if you have um, if you have plaque you're going to be able, it's going to decrease your ability to provide oxygen to those heart cells. I've gotten a little bit, uh, let me back up and simplify. Again, the heart's struggling to pump blood for those with uh, underlying heart conditions. If the, um, if plaque is decreasing the perfusion or the uh, heart, the flow of blood to the heart cells, then that can create injury in and of itself. Uh, there are a couple of other potential problems. The body attempting to eradicate the virus and mo mobilize the immune cells that uh, attack the heart. Again, friendly fire, damage uh, to, to heart muscle cells. Uh, COVID-19 and heart damage continued. Scenario one is where the heart struggles to pump blood due to not enough oxygen. Again, due to decrease of the flow due to plaque. Patients having underlying heart disease uh, or plaque are at higher risk for developing severe symptoms of COVID-19. The heart has difficulty working because it doesn't have oxygen. Um, so therefore it can't deliver oxygen to the rest of the body as well either. The lungs aren't working well, they're fill, filled with fluid and inflammation. So that was scenario one. And that's again, um, the inflammation area uh, scenario that's the um, um, the inability to continue to pump uh, because of loss of oxygen because of loss of blood flow here's scenario two the virus directly damages heart cells ace2 inhi uh, inhibitors and arbs angiotensin uh, converting enzyme that's what ace2 means um, it's a surface protein that covers the heart and lung cells. ACE2 is a double-edged sword. No, normally it has a protective function, but it serves as a modular gateway for the virus to enter cells. So <clears throat> how does it do that? When tissues are damaged like the flu virus, SARS-CoV and other means the body rela releases cytokines to call on more immune cells. Therefore, uh, paradoxically, too much inflammation can actually make things worse. ACE2 acts as an anti-inflammatory. So again, we've, got, we've talked about this multiple times in terms of the ACE2 inhibitors and the ARBs. There are two balancing things. One is um, that ACE receptor allows the virus to get into the cell. So theoretically, that might cause a problem. On the other hand, uh, ACE inhibitors decrease the function of that, uh, that receptor and can decrease the inflammation. So ACE2 inhibitors and ACE2 uh, act as anti-inflammatories. If the virus latches onto the ACE2, the ACE2 gets knocked out, possibly reducing its anti-inflammatory effect. The virus may uh, not only be damaging cells, it may prevent the body from controlling inflammation. So let's go back and talk a little bit more about the cytokine storm. What is a cytokine storm? Uh, those of you who've seen this channel know, again, cytokines are think cyto meaning cell, kine meaning uh, attractant. So cytokines are cell attractants. What kind of cells are we talking about attra attracting? Inflammatory cells. So again, a cytokine storm is where you get a little bit of inflammation. That inflammation releases cytokines, which pulls in more immune cells, which release more cytokines, which release, creates more inflammation. And you get into a, a spiraling effect of more and more and more increase of inflammation. Now, <clears throat> just to go back to uh, the, the comment that I gave the, um, the person earlier, uh, the, the question was, um, is this direct damage to the myocardial cell or is 
is that the problem? And I said, it's likely to be both. And uh, I went into the, the concept about cytokine storms with ARDS or acute respiratory dis distress syndrome. Uh, once you start getting into acute respiratory distress syndrome, it's a very, very, very uh, lethal problem. Uh, without treatment, uh, up to half of people die. It shuts down uh, organ. It, it shuts down organs throughout the body, including not only the heart but liver, kidneys, brain, lungs. So, um, why do some people have a, an elevated response to this, but uh, others don't? Is it genetics? Is it uh, something else? So again, if we know exactly how COVID affects the heart, we know what treatment to use. If it's direct cellular invasion, we would go with antivirals. We would be focusing more on that in terms of treatment. But if it's due to inflammation and the cytokine storms, then more like uh, immunosuppressants. And as you see, a lot of, it's a standard uh, for people once they get into ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, to put them on steroids to decrease that cytokine storm, that inflammation overload, that inability to get oxygen in through the lungs because there's so much fluid in the lungs. So currently there's no treatment, no direct treatment for COVID-19, only supportive care. And uh, again, ongoing uh, discussions on whether to stop using ACE inhibitors and ARBs. Just a couple of other things that we've covered recently. Ivermectin, it's um, for head lice, and it's, show, it's a parasite, anti-parasite drug. It's um, for, um, again, head lice, and it's been found to have a, uh, an improved input, uh, uh, an improved effect for some people with uh, coronavirus. Do we know why yet? Not totally clear. Um, again, a couple of other items that we've covered uh, Germany's testing uh, information. They're showing maybe up to 15, um, 16, 19% of people that we didn't know infected were actually infected before. In other words, a lot more people were infected than we thought. In other words, the lower, uh, probably a lower case fatality rate. In other words, a lot of uh, asymptomatic people. So again, we've covered several different items. Um, hopefully I didn't go too far in circles in terms of covering this balance of um, myocardial damage, heart damage. Again, is it, um, is it direct damage by the virus to the heart muscle or is it inflammation? And the answer is yes, it's probably both, but um, how critical is it to know which one? Well, clearly we'll continue to be using steroids during ARDS once you get to that ARDS space. I think one of the biggest questions though is uh, when and how much of a role are antivirals gonna play? And are things like ivermectin and some of the other antivirals, um, um, hydroxychloroquine, which we've mentioned many times, some of those things um, and some of the antivirals that we've used with uh, age related drugs how much of, uh, of this is gonna become an antiviral treatment play. So uh, at, let's go back now and talk about uh, some um, questions. At Rob, let me see if I can unshare this. And at Rob, quoting another physician article on YouTube, 76% had high blood pressure, 35% had diabetes and 33 had heart disease. Makes you wanna take control of your health. Uh, yeah, you know, if we've covered, if there's one theme to this channel, it's the real hidden pandemic, or the real pandemic that's really killing and disabling people, and that's uh, prediabetes, heart disease. Um, and it's totally unrecognized. Obviously, COVID-19 has gotten huge uh, coverage, but we're killing more people with prediabetes than we are with COVID-19. Uh, it's the number one killer. It's the number one disabler. So thanks again. And yes, you do want to take care of your health. Dave Murphy. Thank you again, David. 
Uh, good morning, David. Thanks for keeping us informed. I really appreciate all your hard work and the rest of your team as well. Stay well and stay safe. Thank you again, David. Uh, David's made another contribution to the channel. And um, Carl, if you could just show folks how they can make contributions. Um, making these contributions does make a big difference in terms of our ability to get this information out there. For a, a couple of years, I basically supported this channel with my day job. I've retired yet again, and, uh, and at this point, I'm supporting the channel with uh, seeing patients, patient care. Um, <clears throat> Hi, Nick. Wouldn't the heart be working very hard trying to get oxygen to supply the body? Exactly right. And Hi, Nick, I don't know if that was you that asked this uh, uh, question originally. Um, I hope that, again, my... Uh, fumbling through the slides today was not too circular, but there's the circularity is a real issue. It, there are two issues going on and we don't really know clearly which issue is the most important. Uh, we do know that we're going to continue to use uh, non-steroidal or I mean, um, uh, steroid anti-inflammatories when somebody gets to significant um, acute respiratory distress syndrome. We just don't know the role of, uh, potential role of antivirals. But yes, that's exactly what's going on. The, the heart is working very hard. It beats 60 to 80, 90 times a minute. And when you start getting into ARDS, acute respiratory distress, that will jack up to 110, 120 times a minute. So it's working harder with less oxygen to work with. So big, big deal. And again, it's, it's spir the heart and our ability to breathe are spiraling out of control. That's what's causing the problem. You heard, uh, I, I don't know if anybody uh, heard Boris Johnson's uh, statement after coming back out of that. And he said there was a 48 hour period. I had a couple of nurses who were watching my ability to breathe and making adjustments every few minutes. That saved me, and that's what sa what is saving people all over uh, the world right now. Brave uh, healthcare providers who know that they're not being protected adequately in most cases from this virus, but still committed to watching these people when they're going through this problem, this spiraling, I don't have enough oxygen, the heart doesn't have enough oxygen to pump, but it's still got to pump harder. And um, whether or not it's going to make it through that time period. So again, major, major uh, bravery and uh, contribution by our intensive care uh, folks, healthcare folks. Ed Rob, referring to underlying conditions above, Yes. Uh, well, you, you know, at Rob, you, you talk about 76% have high blood pressure. You ever wonder what causes high blood pressure? It's not totally uh, accepted and understood yet, but look up um, AGE, Advanced Glycation End Products. There's a very good case to be made that most blood pressure in and of itself, long-term, is probably caused by unrecognized prediabetes. And AGE, advanced glycation in, in products, are things like, you know, hemoglobin A1C is an AGE. It's an advanced glycation in product. And those advanced glycation in products tend to um, uh, jam up the filter, block the filter within the kidney which helps the body control blood pressure. So go back and look that up. Um, this thing about saying, well, it's high blood pressure, not diabetes. And I don't think you're saying that, Rob, but a lot of people are. And making that distinction, I think, is a very, very um, artificial distinction. Thanks for, for bringing that point up. It's a very important one. Uh, Z50, Z6, I think that's Joe Riley. Uh, 10 bucks. Thank you again, Joe, for, uh, uh, for that. At Rob, 
Robin Green, thank you for your explanations and guidance. You're easy to understand and follow. This had a, has a great help to me. Robin, thank you so much for that comment because I felt, again, like on the feature today about specific part damage that I got a little bit wrapped around my axle on that one. So thanks. Anonymous, congrats, Doc, on your retirement. Uh, never knew docs could retire at 35. Well, there's a couple of really nice compliments in there. Uh, thank you for the for the compliments, Anonymous. And I'm having a blast. I'm working, you know, as Janice will tell you, she rolls her eyes every time I talk about being retired. I'm doing uh, 12 to 16 hours, especially with, with the pandemic, because I trained in public health. This is uh, my space. And uh, I, I remember when, well, pardon the digression, but I remember uh, when I worked at Toyota, we used to get up r really early, like uh, what, 5.30, and go play basketball for a couple hours, twice a week. And I remember just being worn out, because this was full court basketball. I remember being worn out and thinking, you know, I'm getting old, I'm getting in my, 50s, late 50s, and starting to uh, get hypertensive. And uh, is this what I'm going to do the rest of my life? Uh, I my own faith system. Um, I'm a a I bounce back and forth between uh, all Christian components: uh, Baptist, Methodist, um, uh, Episcopalian. And um, I remember thinking, you know what? If I leave Toyota, it would be neat to help people who have a uh, lack of understanding of the aging process and lack of understanding of chronic disease, lack of understanding of high blood pressure, lack of understanding of, again, the death, destruction, and disability that's caused by unrecognized prediabetes. And I remember praying at that point, uh, just silently as I was uh, getting my shower uh, after a couple hours of basketball. You know, God, if if I uh, could do that next in my career, I'd be very happy to do that. And that's what I'm doing. Having a blast, 16-hour uh, days. This past week, I cut it down to about eight, 10-hour days for, for five and a half uh, days, six days. But this week I'll be gearing back up again. We've got uh, the book coming out. Um, there's, the book is all about what a stress test won't tell you. It, I mentioned it earlier today. Um, so bottom line is most people think that you find out about whether or not you're gonna have a heart attack by getting a stress test. Stress test doesn't predict heart attacks very well at all. It just doesn't. The reason it doesn't is because uh, it uh, it shows plaque only if you've got 50% or more uh, blockage of your heart. And most heart attacks, two-thirds of heart attacks occur in people that don't have 50% blockage yet. So why do you use stress tests? Well, that's just one of those other really dumb things that we do in terms of medicine in our culture. Um, Here's the problem, though. The book overall appears to be pretty good, except, unfortunately, I took, it's me and bunny holes. I took this giant bunny hole right in the beginning of the book down to about a five or ten page description of inflammation. <laughs> I'm struggling on trying to put that in a footnote or somewhere. Anyhow, Bottom line is we've got a lot of stuff going on. We've got the channel going on. We've got the videos. Uh, we've got a book going on, several courses. We've been doing a lot of uh, events. And now we've got COVID. So, yes, it's uh, I couldn't be having more fun in re my retirement. Thank you for the compliment. Uh, used oxygen for Boris Johnson instead of ventilators. Ventilators allegedly have an 80% death rate. Um, I, I, yes, I know there's, there's a lot of debate around that right now. Um, not quite ready to go into my own opinion on those. I, you know, I think it's sort of like uh, some of the other things that we're seeing. There's some soft signals on, you know, maybe the um, 
the push from the ventilator is creating more inflammation. We've known that that's an issue from day one. However, the question is, uh, does the individual have enough strength to breathe? And I think one of the critical things that people are missing is this. If you don't have enough strength to breathe with your acute respiratory distress syndrome, your arts, you have to go on a ventilator. And somebody that's already that far gone is, yes, much more likely to have to die. So is that 80% death rate, how much of that's due to the fact that they actually put them on a ventilator or due to the fact that they needed to, they were so far gone that they needed the ventilator. So I think that's the major point that I want to get across uh, anonymous to you and others that are asking this question saying, maybe the ventilator's doing damage. Well, we know the ventilator does damage, but making a statement that, well, more people are dying if they go on a ventilator, therefore the ventilator's causing the damage. Hmm, that's not exactly right. There's, you know, that's a causation problem and it's, maybe it's, it's not so much A, the ventilator B causing death, but A, the damage, the extent of damage that somebody's having is causing them to go on the ventilator as well as die. So let's don't assume that the ventilators are doing all that damage at this point. Let's take a look. Hi, Nick. What do you think of gargling with salt water to help boost viral protection? I've heard that comment many times. Brad Bale's got a, a video out where he's suggesting a thing called navage, which is similar to what was the name of that um, neti pot? Remember, neti pots were a big thing for a while, trying to get uh, wash mucus out of your nose. And now Brad's saying get uh, mucus into, I mean, get salt into that area because it forms hydrochloric acid, or hydrochloric acid, which in turn kills the virus. I don't think those are ready for prime time yet. Uh, I do think. We do know the one thing that's having impact right now, and that is distancing. And no, I'm not going to call, call it social distancing. That we came out of the blocks calling that, and that's the wrong thing. It's physical distancing. K King, these people, these medical people going in and out without protection deserves a medal. There is absolutely no question about that. We covered that in our. Uh, in our silver linings thing, here's one, one silver lining for me. We are not going to ignore, continue to ignore all the warnings we've already gotten about the next pandemic. The public health geeks have been talking about the next pandemic, the next hundred year pandemic for decades. And it's been ignored for a whole bunch of obvious reasons. It won't be ignored anymore. We, and really simple, easy things like um, more sources than one or two places for N95 masks, more sources than one or two places for gowns, more sources than one or two places for gloves. So again, major changes, um, but we're gonna lose a lot of lives getting there. So it is what it is. Nancy DeBosek. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you and Janice for the work you do. I have high blood pressure and my husband has Sjogren's. Nancy gave us the $10, uh, I don't know if that's a super chat button or what that is. It's a big yellow button. Thank you so much for your help. And thanks for being focused on your, uh, your own health. Here's one of the key things about this. We, um, we all can do a lot better and very few of us are going to end up needing something as significant as insulin. Um, so a couple of different points. This is not, I mean, we have, as a population, ignored the big pandemic of prediabetes. And that's the tragedy because it is treatable. Vast majority of heart attacks, the vast majority of strokes, the vast majority of um, cognitive decline are all preventable. Dan Frank, is there a link on PrevMed's site to make a donation? 
Uh, Carl, will you play? Uh, Carl, are you there? Well, uh, not sure where Carl went, unfortunately. Yes, we do have several sites. Let me go back, Dan. Let me show you. Actually, we've got a. Um, first of all, I'm going to just make a note. We have several different places and ways. You can do it on um, Patreon. Here, let me go back and show you something real quick. And Carl, if you do, it looks like Carl actually dropped. Hmm. So Dan, thank you for your patience. Let me see if I can show you this. There are several different ways to make a contribution. One is using PayPal and you can just take, I think you can take a picture on the, um, on the slide here. Another way you can do that is go to YouTube live, go down to where you make comments, just to the right of that smiley face where you make a comment. There's a little dollar sign you can make it under hide next to hide chat. You can click on that. You can donate through Patreon. Um, and actually, I will uh, ask a, about a PrevMed donation site. Thank you again, Dan. I appreciate your question. Let me see if I can go back out and deal with some other questions. Uh, anonymous, biofilm probably causes high blood pressure. Well, it depends on, yes, again, I, um, I think a lot of the AGE, advanced glycation end products, uh, forming a biofilm in the filter of the kidney, actually just prior to the filter uh, mechanism of the kidney. Uh, David Drake, endothelial damage may mean morbid morbidity, I think is what you want morbidity down the line, but muscle cell damage and myocarditis seems prominent with this virus. Good point. No argument there. In addition, the, the lung damage long term, even in now asymptomatic patients, needs to be watched. No question about that. The radiologist sees more damage than patients have symptoms. Will that improve? Uh, David's really good point. It's an interesting thing. Um, I've covered this several times where you have, you sound like a medical person, so you may recognize the term ground glass appearance. Um, especially even with kids, for example, where kids were otherwise healthy. Uh, they, one of the early uh, articles in the New England Journal chronicling this problem showed that kid, even kids had a huge, most of them ended up having a lot of ground glass appearance on their chest x-ray. Now, what does that mean? That's exactly what David Drake is talking about. People that didn't end up going into ICU didn't end up having uh, significant uh, long-term problems that we know of, still had significant uh, inflammation within the lungs. That's what that ground glass appearance was. That was fluid. Uh, distributed throughout the lungs. So a lot of a lot of stuff to be looking out for long term. Now the obviously the hope is that this is a short term inflammation process within the lungs and results in healing. Um, we're not so clear that that's uh, that that's going to be the case. Hi Nick, how about turmeric for inflammation just in case someone gets the virus? Well, we've done I, I'm one of the few channels that covers both the medical side in terms of, you know, actual standard medications like metformin, pioglitazone, ACE uh, inhibitors, ARBs, but also I cover uh, 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 supplements as well. And turmeric is a supplement that uh, has pretty good evidence that it works. 
Now, most of these over-the-counter supplements work to a certain extent. For example, berberine and, um, and cinnamon and uh, some other things for uh, diabetes and prediabetes. But compared to something like uh, pioglitazone or metformin, not, not nearly so much. On the other hand, many people think they're safer. Clearly, maybe safer than, than pioglitazone, but metformin is not that. Uh, not that unsafe. I think it actually should have been an over-the-counter. Now, in terms of uh, safety and e efficacy or power, nothing works like lifestyle. And we've seen it time and time and time again. Curcumin, turmeric, um, berberine, cinnamon, medications like uh, even insulin, um, all of these things, very minimal impact compared to losing 10 pounds or 30 pounds, or like the patient that I saw last month, 150 pounds. There's just nothing, that, no surgery that we can do, no medication we can pres prescribe, no supplement is going to have the impact that lifestyle has. And it doesn't have to be 150 pounds. Uh, it is crystal clear. Uh, just minimal uh, lifestyle choices like um, decreased calories, decrease for most people, not everybody, uh, improved um, getting up off the couch, moving around, um, aerobic uh, exercise, resistance training, um, high intensity intervals. All these things make a big, big difference in terms of uh, pre-diabetes and the chronic diseases that go with it. K. King, magnesium helped me lower my blood pressure and get off my meds. Magnesium is uh, something that I use as well. Magnesium is very helpful. Magnesium is also very helpful for atrial fibrillation. Uh, for the, and a lot more people have atrial fibrillation than know it. Um, it's called paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. It's sort of like pre-diabetes, one of those things that... Um, very common, in fact, far more common than we know. Nick Christopherson, so glad I got rid of my type 2 diabetes about 18 months ago. Very good. I went from a 10.3 A1C to a 4.7. Wow, Nick, that's amazing. What, what, what did you do? Lose 50 pounds? Or Interesting. Love to hear about it. K. King, however, I still have diabetes. Nick, what's t uh, T2D is type 2 diabetes, and how did you get the A1C down? I had the same question. How'd you do it? How'd you do it? Bill Clifford, thank you again. Uh, thanks again from an old bunny hunter. <laughs> I was always disappointed when the rabbit my beagle was chasing went down <laughs> the groundhog hole. I'm sorry, I have to share another personal story. My grandfather, uh, Neltz, I mean, not Neltz, uh, Weaver Meggs, if you want to look that name up. He is in the Foxhound Hall of Fame, but he had some um, national class beagles as well. I remember a couple of them, Blocky and a couple of others. And whenever we go to North Carolina, it was an hour and a half away. I lived in Spartanburg, South Carolina. My mother grew up in Union County, North Carolina. Just, uh, what is that, east of Charlotte? Just not far from Charlotte. We would go up there, and, and he'd always take us out rabbit hunting with his beagles. And uh, I remember it was so interesting. We, we, he'd rarely shoot them. It, we, he'd just take them out to run us and run the dogs a little bit and run the rabbits a little bit. I remember we walked up on something. He saw I saw something that looked like a chestnut with little spikes there, and he had his cane with him. And he touched this chestnut and it was fur and it was a rabbit. So the rabbit took off and uh, that was a big deal for a little, for an eight year old boy. Uh, so yeah, a lot of uh, rabbit hunting. Uh, uh, personal history, Dan Franks, gotten a ton of value from your videos over the past few years. Thank you again, Dan, I appreciate that. And um, 
One of the things we're working on, we just had a long discussion with Jerry about improving the editing quality and the style. As you can tell, uh, it is difficult. You have to think and pay attention because of the bunny holes that I go down. Sometimes I get a little bit confused on the, uh, on the slides. We're going to start doing things that make it a little bit easier, uh, developing more uh, better edited uh, videos, focusing on titles which help people link into the importance of the topic rather than talking about you know, your typical medical topic. So uh, hopefully you'll start seeing some good things over the next few months. Jan H, Chinese info is suspect at all levels. I would, it would be naive to assume that the Xi, uh, I think you meant Xi Ping, or I can't remember his name. The uh, Kabul is not focused to turn their instigated chaos into global political success. No comment. Uh, wouldn't argue with a lot of that. David Drake, ten dollars. Thank you so much, David. I appreciate the um, the contribution, and my team does as well. Just by the way, ten dollars is a big deal because um, Carl and some of our other folks are working with us from the Philippines, um, and I'm not sure why Carl dropped off. It may have been because uh, they do have some connection problems there, um, but. Uh, Ten bucks makes a big difference. A lot of folks in the Philippines are working on two dollars to uh, five, six bucks an hour. So again, for our staff, uh, that makes a big difference. Thanks, Kathy Topia. Always love your videos. Thank you for taking the time. Watching from Roswell, New Mexico. Well, I'm jealous, and I love the two little uh, uh, what do you call those things? The the uh, aliens there. Nick Christopherson, you're right, lost 50 pounds. I got it, I guess the number right too. So if you don't, don't remember Nick Christopherson, as you uh, may remember, said he went from what? A hemoglobin A1C of 10 to less than five. A hemoglobin A1C of less than five is a world-class good number for us uh, baby boomers. I tend to hang around the low fives. It was when I started getting up into the high fives that I really started having problems with my uh, um, <clears throat> OGTT. And by the way, while I'm there, quick digression, quick bunny hole. You know, there was an article in the New England Journal about three or four years ago that looked at the the death rates based on uh, hemoglobin A1C, and it was about here until you hit 5.3. And once people started getting a hemoglobin A1C of 5.3, they started dying faster and faster as it, in, as it increased. Now, here's the thing. You would say, well, oh, that was diabetic people. No, it was not. And that was a major part of the title. It's looking at hemoglobin A1C in people that are, quote, not diabetic, end quote, Meaning, again, as I've said many times before, it's that unrecognized pre-diabetes pandemic that's killing and disabling us through heart attacks, strokes, and uh, kidney disease, most common cause of blindness, um, other things. So be very sensitive to your hemoglobin A1C and don't wait on that to start uh, finding out whether or not you have this problem. Go ahead and do the definitive testing. Do a, an OGTT, oral glucose tolerance test. That's the thing where you, uh, you fast for eight hours, then you get a fasting blood sugar, and then take the, uh, the glucose drink and uh, test it one hour later, the glucose, and two hours later, at least do that. Uh, most people wait on a and their doctors wait on a hemoglobin A1C of six or more to say, well, you've got a blood sugar problem or you've got prediabetes and seven or more to say you've got diabetes. Well, that go, you go back and think about it. That flies in the face of what we know with research that once you start hitting a hemoglobin A1C of 5.2 or 5.3 or more, you're starting to die faster. So, Really? Do we not want to take a look at that? Okay, so thanks for sharing, Nick. And again, 
congratulations on getting a um, hemoglobin A1C below five. I am jealous. Um, Miguel Duran Ruiz, Dr. Ford, are there any numbers of cardiomyopathy due to COVID-19? Well, again, right now it's so early in this pandemic. We know that it's doing damage to the heart muscle, cardiomyopathy. The question is long-term. I don't think anybody knows the answer to that yet. Cathetopia, I'm 54 A1F. Not sure, I think maybe you meant to say 5.4 A1C, not sure. Is, is that if that's what you meant? Uh, M. Yagmore, does vitamin D3 increase ACE2? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I know that vitamin D3 has shown a lot of evidence that it does decrease um, insulin resistance. So Kathy Topi is clarifying. I'm 54 and I have an A1C that is 5.5. Very good. Um, you should get an OGTT, an insulin uh, survey on that. And I don't, when I say very good, 5.5 is not a great number. Uh, you, you know what the numbers are after having heard this conversation. Nick Christofferson, this is the fellow that lost 50 pounds and decreased his hemoglobin A1C from 10 plus to five minus, less than five. Also having 12 hours of no food or water, then having eight hour e eating window. Excellent, that's called closing that eating window. A lot of people, what, what's that most often called? It's most often called, um, um, intermittent fasting, or you could also call it skipping breakfast for most folks. It's better to skip dinner if you're gonna do that, but that's harder to do for social reasons. Okay, so Nick Christopherson, also uh, eight hour eating window, Circ circadian rhythm was the easiest and the hardest thing to do. Being fast asleep by 10 is so hard, and I'm also 45, but feel and look, 20 years younger. Well, good for you, Nick. Fantastic. Cathetopia, yes. Health Jazz, hoeing for the beat. Not sure. Cathetopia, yes. Jackie Shaheen, IF, intermittent fasting. There you go. Well, guys, it's been a uh, it's been a fun morning. I appreciate your um, sharing uh, and your interest today. And I'm going to sign off. Thanks again.